Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu to all my brothers and sisters in Islam and peace and blessings to all my brothers and sisters in humanity. Uh, this is the first of a series of videos we're going to be doing on uh, misconceptions, uh, which is the accusations um, aimed at Islam. Um, most of these claims come from Christian missionaries, um, whether they're based on deliberate deception, so that they're actually out to deceive people, or whether it's just um, misunderstanding that they, they've misunderstood terms or they've, they've misunderstood the language or, or something along these lines. But basically, these misconceptions. So, for example, you have like taqiyya. This is one thing we'll be covering. You have, does the sun set in a muddy pool? That's another one. Uh, the other one I can think of is, for example, oh, does sperm come from the ribs? Anyway, anyway, so you, you get the idea, isn't it? Right, now today's misconception we want to deal with, it's basically a claim that came out of the debate between Muhammad Hijab and David Wood uh, with regards Allah praying. Um, so David Wood made the, the uh, a claim that Allah's praying. And what's happened from that, Christian missionaries who have watched this video, they think they have something. And we've seen it online and we've, you know, in, in High Park, we've had uh, Christian missionaries asking pathetic questions like, how many times does he pray? Or, who is the hero of the prayer? You know, uh, and it's just ridiculous. So, um, we, I was going to do a res direct response um, to this, but we have a brother called Abu Ayyub and he has a YouTube channel called Simply Sira. And mashallah, that brother has done such a detailed response to this uh, misconception. So what we decided to do for this particular uh, misconception is that we're going to allow we're going to roll his video after this introduction, and uh, you you will see such a breakdown. Now, this particular video is not just for Muslims. Alhamdulillah, Muslims will watch it. They'll they'll see the deception that's gone on. They'll know how to respond to it. Should anyone come and be stupid enough after uh, it's been refuted so many times but anyway um they'll know how to respond to it and even if muslims start to have doubts within themselves oh, how good, is this true it will respond to that but what it will do also is highlight the deceptive nature of christian missionaries you'll actually when you actually see how it's broken down you will actually see how they twisted things and this should make you christians think not your missionaries because i know how you operate but lay christians when they see the lengths that their um, missionaries um, and scholars uh, have to go to, to twist something, to find something to attack Islam with, you should start questioning this. And, and once you see the breakdown of this and you realise, wow, this is just a simple thing, um, so easy to refute it, question the things they say. Don't take everything at face value. Question what they say. So anyway, so this video, mashallah, will follow after this introduction. Um, what I will say as well is that if you do enjoy the style and the breakdown of the video by Brother Abu Ayyub, he also has a podcast called uh, Muslims Apologetic Podcast. Now, uh, he does this with another brother you may know, uh, Ijaz Ahmed. He was one of the brothers, mashallah, who came to the park recently. And some of you guys will just caught a glimpse of the knowledge that he has, mashallah. So, like I said, if you like the style of what he does, then inshallah, please uh, subscribe to their podcast. Um, and you, you get so much valuable information from that. And that's that. So, inshallah, pay attention, watch the video, inshallah. We're looking forward to the comments. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Okay, bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Um, today I'm going to be going through... Uh, a lecture series talking about the subject which is entitled does Allah pray a detailed response to missionaries false claim against Islam uh, my name is Abu Ayyub and I run simply Sira it's both a, a YouTube channel and a website and you can find me on Twitter and Facebook as well um, so this is going to be part one of this particular subject and we're going to go through a series of this um, covering this subject, inshallah, it's going to be a, quite an extensive uh, lecture, and this is the first part of that series. So, an intro into the argument now. The so the verse in question of "Does Allah pray?" 
It's it goes as in Allah wa malaikatu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhalladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima So the general um translation of this of the verse 3356 uh, is from Sahih International which is translated as Indeed, Allah confers blessings upon the Prophet and his angels ask him to do so. O you who have believed, ask Allah to confer blessings upon him and ask Allah to grant him peace. And um, But for this lecture, particular lecture series, we want to translate it exactly how it is to be able to study this. So my particular translation of this is going to be word for word. And we're not going to translate these three words here that are highlighted in red you saloon and salu these are both the same word and salimu so the, the way we would translate this then is indeed allah and his angels you saloon upon the prophet and we don't know what you saloon is right now O you who have believed send salat and salam upon him okay and the reason why i want to do this is because we're going to work backwards from we're going to work around the words to understand what those words mean by the statements of the scholar. So we're going to begin this as if we don't understand what this means. And I want to show you exactly how the scholars approach words that they might not know exactly the meaning of it, right? Now, I want to cover the goal the missionaries have with presenting this particular verse. Um, th what they say is um, when they... When they present this verse, what they're going to say is you saloon is going to be the the understanding for the Muslim. So we have five daily prayers, salat, and we consider that to be prayers. The category we call that salat. So what they're going to try to argue is you saloon in this particular verse, in Allah wa malaikatu, you saloon ala nabi, that they're going to say that that's similar to the salat of what the Muslims do, the five daily prayers or the sunnah prayers, so on and so forth. And they are going to try their utmost to uphold this concept. Okay, and they're going to play the ignorant card. They're going to act like they don't really know. They're going to ignore all the statements of the scholars, so on and so forth, right? And so after making this false premise, which is based upon the fallacy of equivocation, as we're going to see in a moment what this definition is, They'll then proceed to ask the Muslim, who is Allah praying to, right? And of course, this is based upon, they're, they're setting up a false premise already. And they're demanding that you interpret the verse the way that they do with the fallacy of equivocation, right? <clears throat> and the reason why the missionary is doing this, the goal behind this is twofold. The first one is they're trying to justify jesus praying to the father in the bible all right while at the same time being still considered a god because the missionaries they find muslims when they approach them the muslims will pre present the multiple uh, passages in the bible where jesus is actually praying to the father requesting something that he cannot provide himself so this the muslim will take this as a proof that jesus isn't god right and what then they'll try to do is, is then they'll look at the Quran and Sunnah and then try to extrapolate and interpret some type of prayer or something that would show that the, the God of Islam is asking and requesting a possible second God <laughs> in the Godhead like that of, of that was G, that Jesus is doing. And again, this is a false interpretation um, as we're going to see. So that's the first reason why they're trying to find something, a justification. So you'll hear them. They'll say, well, I believe my God can pray. Um, and why can't yours? Which is ridiculous because and on the basis, as we're going to see the basis foundation, theologically, this is impossible for a God to pray when praying is if you're going to consider prayer ibadah, as we're going to see in the upcoming lectures where you're asking for something you can't provide yourself then this is considered kufr in Islam. It's you're you're not a Muslim anymore. You, your theology is broken. You don't understand Allah um, in the in, with the proper understanding. So that's the first reason why they do this. The second reason is they're trying to insinuate multi personalities within the Islamic understanding of God. So they're trying to find a Trinity or a Bayun God. They're trying to force that idea upon Islam because 
for those that don't know, um, for the Muslims that are listening, um, Christianity, they believe in a triune Godhead, meaning that there's three personalities and one being three persons, one being the father, the son, and the Holy spirit. And they speak to one another and they try to find this type of relationship where they can pray to one another. They can love one another eternally and all this stuff. And they're trying to force that with this question. So they say, well, who is Allah praying to? Then they're trying to insinuate that possibly Allah is a part of a Godhead. And then since he's praying to somebody else to provide something which he can't provide himself. This is ridiculous. There's nowhere in the verse does it, it does it insinuate this. Nowhere, nor does anywhere in Islamic doctrine, theology, does it insinuate that God is asking somebody else outside himself for something that he can't provide himself. Okay, so now let's, with the word salat, let's cover what the fallacy of equivocation is, right? The definition, in logic, the term equivocation is a fallacy which results when a particular word or expression has multiple meanings, but is used as if it only has one interpretation, right? And that's what's t taking place right here. They're demanding that salat means exactly how it's being interpreted for the Muslim, for the believer. And they're saying, well, then that has to be Allah and the angels as well. This in turn leads to an incorrect conclusion based upon one or more false premises. So we're going to break this down and, um, and I'm going to show you how this is, uh, how this can be false and give you examples. I'm going to give you two basic ex examples at first. And then at the end, I'm going to give you the example that the Christians are presenting um, to show you how, uh, how they're false. But before we go into that, um, two things I want to cover. The first thing is um, I want to cover or explain that whenever we're going to be presenting an argument, we need to identify the category of the person doing the action. And then after we identify the category, then we can look at what the action is or the verb as we're going to see uh, most of the time. Um, and both can be different. And both can actually affect one another. And you're going to see what I mean right now in the first example. So example one, we have premise one. P1 is it's usually defined as. Um, and the argument goes, this is just an example. So your average phone can run eight hours if fully charged. Now here we have the category of phone and the action of run. And this means electronics running. Premise two, the out of shape man can only run for 10 minutes. Okay, and again, we have the category of the out of shape man and then the action of running. Therefore, if you electrocute the man, he should be able to run longer. Meaning if you apply what you did to the phone to the human being, since you think that the running is exactly the same, then you should be able to get the same conclusion, which is false. It's a false conclusion, right? And the reason why it's false is because the phone that running for the phone, the category that's happening in premise one is different than the category that's happening in premise two, right? Phone is a category. And so therefore the, uh, the, the meaning of run or the action or the verb changes based upon the category of the person doing it. And the out of shape man, the human being, when he runs, it changes based upon the category of the person, the, the word run changes, right? Uh, second example I'm going to give you is based upon, I'm going to use the Bible now. And just to give you an example of how we'd say somebody who is biased can approach the Bible in a very rude way. Um, let's just say, for example, an atheist approached the Bible and they wanted to make fun of the Bible. And it's very easy if you're biased and if you were going to use this methodology of equivocation, meaning that you're demanding one particular interpretation of a word and then it has to be laid out, drawn out on all the words then therefore and that it can't change. So premise one, a man needs a light to smoke, i.e. a flame. Now, for our brothers that are living in the UK, I don't know if you use this term as well, um, light. You know, in, in America, we say, can I get a light if you want to get, uh, ask for a lighter or matches. So this example, premise one, a man needs a light to smoke. Okay. Premise two, 
in the Bible, God says, let there be light. Okay. Now we don't know exactly what light means here, but if we're going to play this game of equivocation, imagine an atheist doing this, right? Therefore, the God of the Bible must smoke, right? An atheist could come and they could lie and laugh and then lie and laugh and say, hey, God uh, had a cigarette in the beginning of creation and he said, let there be light to be able to light a cigarette. Now, the Christian, of course, I want our Christian friends that are listening to this. We know what you're going to say automatically to this. Of course, this isn't real because we have in our theology a negation of false attributes, meaning that already the theology of Christianity, even though Christians believe that God can come incarnate, there's still some positive attributes theologically for who God is. And of course, his power and his, uh, his lack of need of other things, even though within the Godhead, sadly, they think that there's three persons that need one another for other things. Nevertheless, when it comes to things like this, very, very clear and apparent insulting attributes that are being applied to God, they will say that previously there's already a negation of God ever having uh, needed to smoke or need of anything because smoking itself is an addiction. It means that this is a lowly status, so on and so forth, right? So there's already based the, 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 we would say the refutation of this is theological before even it's linguistic. Okay. And so now going into the, the argument that missionaries are saying with Salat, this is the same argument that we say. We say theologically, there's already a negation of what you're trying to insinuate. Let me, let me break down the argument and then we can go through it. So. The third example is premise one, Muslims do the action of Salat as worship and request to help uh, for, of help and aid. So our prayer, the five daily prayers and the, the Sunnah, we call it the Sunnah prayers, the extra prayers. We have the obligatory prayers and the, sun, the, the, the Sunnah prayers. Number one, we're following the command of God, right? And why do we follow the command of God? Because we fear God. We, we hope for his reward. Okay, and we need his help. We're in need of God. Now, theologically, God, in our theology, we believe God is not in need of anybody else, right? Everything is in need of God, but God is not in need of any, anything else. So, when we go to premise two, which the Christian will say, Allah also does the action of Salat in verse 33, 56 of the Quran. We already know theologically due to the negation of false attributes that this cannot be the salat that muslims do but the missionary will say this the, their conclusion will be right um that allah must be worshiping and asking for help from someone else which is theologically just like the god of the bible would be asking for a light to smoke a cigarette we would say for God to be doing an action of worship, what we call in Arabic, ibadah, right? Which that translates as prayer. Ibadah is prayer, which means worship, which means seeking help and aid. For you to say that God is doing that, you've, you've completely jumped over, looked over the, the foundational theological concepts within Islam. And you're just looking at it linguistically. And you're demanding a singular interpretation of that word, which is the fallacy of equivocation. So now we're just, aside from that, we're just going to go through a quick reply as to why is this is false. Okay, we're going through this whole lecture series to go really, really in depth linguistically why this is false. But simply there is, we, we call it a menhaj or a, a way, an approach for our um the way that we study Islam. So before we go into depth into this lecture and present the arguments from the various angles as to why missionaries logic is not only incorrect, but hypocritical, I'd first re I, I would first like to uh, present the quickest reply possible to this doubt. So if you don't want to watch anything else, this is sufficient, just this first lecture. So before we begin, though, we need to establish some basic foundational concepts as to what is considered the sources of religious doctrine in Islam. OK, and it is through this that we can find out what is the real interpretation of any particular verse 
or practice. Okay. Islam is based upon, we have a text. We have, we have the Quran and Sunnah, right? Um, as we're going to see, we have doctrine. We have sources for our doctrine. We don't just make it up as we go along. Okay. So what are the Islam's doctrinal sources? Um, the, they are based upon three things. They're based upon the Quran, as I stated, what is known as the Sunnah and the uh, Salaf al-Salih. Um, I wrote here Salaf, but you, the, the, the longer term is a Salaf al-Salih, right? The Quran being the word of God revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The Sunnah being the actions, statements, and religious explanations given by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And the Salaf, or a Salaf al-Salih, as I stated before being those from the first three generations of Muslims who practiced Islam. As it was narrated from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu The best of people are those living in my generation, then those who follow them, then those who follow them. And this means the best in practice of Islam, in understanding of Islam, right? And for that reason, these are the main people that we take from. If we cannot understand it clearly from the Quran or from the Sunnah here means the, the books of Ahadith, then we go and we look at the companions of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, or peace be upon him, and we see how they've understood it. And if we can understand it correctly from them, then we understand it from those who follow them, the, the second and the third generations. Imam al nawawi he comments on this hadith saying, As-Sahih inna qarnahu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as-Sahaba wa thani at-tabi'oon wa thalith tabi'ahum. The correct opinion is that the Prophet's generation means his companions, i.e. the Sahaba, then the second are those who follow them, i.e. the Tabi'een. And it's important to note here, you can say at-tabi'oon, or a tabi'in. It doesn't necessarily need to have harf al jar to, to be a tabi'in. So I'm personally going to call this group a tabi'in, like you would say al muslimun or muslimin, al mushrikun or mushrikin. Um, so just to, just, just to reiterate um, and to make this point, I'm going to continue on saying a tabi'in. And then the third are those who follow them, which is a tabi'in. All right. So to understand this, a Sahaba, again, just to reiterate, Sahaba, the definition of Sahaba, for those that don't know, it means a person who met the Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He became, he, he believed during the life of the Prophet Muhammad and he died upon that belief. Okay. That's the definition of a Sahabi. Okay. Then after that, you have a Tabi'een. Now, a tabi'in, the definition of a tabi'i, or if you want to say plural, a tabi'in, it means a person who was met a sahabi, was a believer, and died as a believer. Okay? And then the third category is tabi' tabi'in. And those are the, the person, just to clarify a little bit, just like a tabi'in, person who met a tabi'i, uh, was a believer and died as a believer. Okay. So, so from what we understand uh, from this is that the first three generations were upon the fu purest form of Islam and therefore their interpretation of the Islamic text would be considered the most accurate and should take precedence over all other interpretations. Okay. So whatever tafsir we have, if we can have a statement from the Sahaba or the Tabi'een or the Tabi Tabi'een, then those take precedence over Ibn Kathir, of, over any other tafsir. And actually the, the methodology of, of Mufassirin, um, like Ibn Kathir, is that they're taking from these generations. It's not like they weren't applying these, um, this type of approach. So with that said, I would like to present to you a tafsir or interpretation of this verse by a man named Abu Al-Aliya Rafi bin Mahran. Okay, and you can just say his kunya is Abu Al-Aliya or his nickname 
we translate that as is Abu al Aliya. Now, who is Abu al Aliya? He is a scholar of Islam who learned under the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He was born during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, but since he was young, he didn't manage to become a Muslim until the rule of Abu Bakr. So he was alive. He met the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, but because he was young of age, he didn't. He wasn't able to become Muslim in time. Um, so he became Muslim after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, passed away during the time of the Khalifa of the of uh, Abu Bakr radiAllahu anhu. So because of that, he's considered a Tabi. Okay, he's considered from the Tabi'in because why? The definition of a Sahabi is that you were a believer during the time that you met the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So, by definition, he's a Tabi. But he, 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 uh, he lived during the, life, the time when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was alive. And it's important to note that this isn't an average, average Tabi. But instead, he's considered from the Kibar al-Tabi'in. Okay? Or you can say Kibar al-Fuqaha of that time, from the Tabi'in. Meaning that from the biggest of them. We have Kibar al-Sahaba, and then we have after that, basically, just to put it simply, he's considered one of the greatest of the people of that particular group. So you have for the Sahaba, you have like Abu Bakr is first, Omar, Uthman, Ali, so on and so forth. These are considered the greatest of the Sahaba. So Abu Al-Ali is considered one of the greatest of the, the Tabi'in. And he learned directly under the greatest people from the companions, who we would call the Kibar al-Sahaba, the best, the best of them. So for example, قال, uh, قال أبو عمر الداني أخذ أبو العالي القراءة عرضا عن أبي وزبير وابن أباس It is narrated from Abu Amr al-Dani that Abu al-Ali took his recitation of the Quran from Ubay, uh, from Ubay ibn, in, ibn Ka'ib right? and Zayd and Ibn Abbas. So these aren't just normal people that he learned under. He learned under the some of the greatest of the Sahabi. Um, Hafsa bint Sirin قالت قال لي أبو العالية قرأت القرآن على عمر رضي الله عنه ثلاثة مرارا. It is narrated from Hafsa bint Sirin who said Abu العالية told me I recited the Quran to Umar رضي الله عنه three times. So he sat there and he he recited his Quran to the second greatest companion <laughs> and the, the second Khalifa. I mean, how, how, what pure version interpretation of Quran would you get than from having an Isnad that goes from Omar, <laughs> you know, subhanAllah. And then it's also narrated. The third example is Qala Abu Bakr bin Abi Dawood, وليس أحد بعد الصحابة أعلم بالقرآن من أبي من أبي العالية. Abu Bakr uh, ibn Abi Dawood, and this isn't Abu Bakr uh, al Sadiq رضي الله عنه. This is a different Abu Bakr. He said that there's no one after the Sahaba, meaning the companions of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, more knowledgeable about the Quran than Abu al Ali. Subhanallah. So, um, so suffice it to say that Abu al Aliya is the most credible source of tafsir for the Quran after a direct quote from either the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or the companions. So, what does he say about this verse? Okay. And I just want to reiterate this before we, we, say, we cover what he says about this. I mean, really, just to reiterate, he learned from the greatest of the companions. He was directly a student of them. So whatever whatever interpretation he's going to have right now, we should consider this to be one of the best tafsirs that you can get your hands on. Okay? So, عن أبي العالية في قوله إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي So he, in relation to the verse, it is narrated from Abu al Aliya about the verse, indeed Allah and His angels, you saluna uh, uh, or you upon the Prophet. 
I was about to say uh, pray, but it's not. It doesn't mean pray. Okay, it means you saloon. Okay. Um, قال صلاة الله عز وجل عليه ثناءه عليه. For which he said, Allah's salat means speaking highly of him. Okay, ثناءه عليه. So subhanallah, it's done. We have a tafsir. It doesn't say salat is ibadah. It doesn't say Allah yatlaba min akhirin. Uh, Allah is asking for something. It's saying that it's thana'ahu alayh. That it is speaking highly of him. And we're gonna, I'm going to go a little bit more into what thana'a means. But then he also, in addition to that, in this, uh, in this narration, he actually differentiates between the salat of the malaika. He says, وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ وَسَلَاتُ الْمَلَائِكَ عَلَيْهِ الدُّعَاءِ أَيْ يَدْعُونَ لِلنَّاسِ وَيَسْتَغْفِرُونَ لَهُمْ And the salat of the angels is that they make dua for him, meaning that they pray and ask Allah to forgive him. So in this relation, in, in this instance, yes, the, the malaika's salat in this is considered dua and praying. It's considered... A, Ibadah, I wouldn't. I don't think necessarily if it falls under that category, because ibadah is for the human beings. Is w the human beings get jannah and nar? They get heaven and hell. Whereas, whereas the angels, they don't have free will, and therefore they don't get the reward of heaven or hell. So, uh, it doesn't. It it doesn't necessarily fall under the category, the same category as human beings when it does this. But they're following the command of Allah that He set up, where He says that they are in need; um, they do what they are commanded to do, right? And this narration, just for those people that might question it, well, is this Sahih? Al Albani considered this narration to be Sahih, meaning credible. It's considered to be authentic. And if you want further, if you want to look further into it, you can look in Fasl al Salat ala Nabi. You can look into the particular chapter of. Um, sending a salat upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So let's just cover real real quick What does the concept of Thina Allahu ala Rasulihi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam What does Thina here As you can see the word Thina What does that mean um, Now it means praise It means being pleased and speaking highly Another word in Arabic is Medih You can If you speak highly of a person of them, um, that that's considered thina, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, He can speak highly of people, and we've seen this, uh, and He can speak highly of His Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we see this. It takes place not only in the heavens, okay, amongst the angels, but also on earth as well with the Quran, because throughout the Quran we find many verses where Allah speaks highly of the Prophet Muhammad's noble character, peace be upon him, and qualities. Like, for example, Allah addresses the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, directly saying, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقًا عَظِيمٌ And indeed, you are of great moral character. This is a madah. This is, uh, this is something that is a considered thina. It's, 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 uh, it's something you're praising the person for their good, their good character, something positive about them, right? So with that said, now um, we've come to this this delil, this proof itself for anybody that knows the basics of Islam and have studied asul tafsir. This is this is sufficient. This is enough. The argument should be done with. Um, we could we could close this close up the book and go home now. There's no more argument here. We have a strong the strongest form of. A tafsir being presented which number one explains that the salat of Allah is not prayer okay and you can't blame a Muslim if he by mistake says prayer and he translates it you know we we're just this is just a slip of the tongue you know I almost did it in this lecture right but that's not what it means and even if a Muslim on the street tells you this that's not that that goes that doesn't erase the fact that Islam is based upon certain steps that you have to take to interpret stuff. So there's precedence, you know, and any the Prophet Muhammad 
uh, precedes his interpretation, precedes any companion. The companion's interpretation, if the, we can't get it from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then the companion's interpretation takes precedence over any tabi, tabi, any person from the second generation. And then their interpretation takes precedence over anyone from the third, uh, third generation. And the third generation takes precedence over all others, right? And then after that, we have a methodology of how the scholars and ijma and these types of things. And, uh, but that's, that's different. That's another subject. What we're talking about here is we have a proof from a tabi, from one of the tabi'in. So it is sufficient knowledge. It is done with. The argument is finished with. And we're going to keep going through this afterwards. We're going to go through the linguistics as to why this is for just to understand why this takes place in the problems. But nevertheless, anybody that has, you know, if their knowledge is worth anything, the weight of a mustard seed, seed this would be sufficient for them. So inshallah, uh, we are going to continue this, the second part. Um, and Jazakallah khair for listening. And inshallah, um, I hope this was beneficial for you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.